uh, Jeffrey's already given a summary of, of the theme for this um, spring series. Um, I'll just give a brief overview as well as a more specific introduction to today's topics of interest. Um, our speakers are uh, Professor Matthew Fisher from the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, and Dr. Dave Ecker, co-founder and vice president of Strategic Innovations for Ionis Pharmaceuticals. So the foundation's approach includes a spectrum of theoretical, experimental, and practical advances, um, understanding the fundamental physics, quantum mechanics, electrodynamics, and uh, thermodynamics is obviously important. Uh, but more specifically, we'd like to understand this physics within uh, the biological and the physiological context uh, with the emphasis on furthering the study of medicine. And overall, we'd like to see this knowledge translated um, into and translated and applied in new um, diagnostics and therapeutics. And this is what we mean by from quantum bench to bedside. And, and while previous uh, lecture series have focused more towards the theoretical end, um, we thought it would be useful to juxtapose the basic science with very practical challenges involved in transforming that science into a worthwhile medicine. So on the bench side of things, um, this quite a bit of progress has been made. So research suggests that quantum coherence might be implicated in energy and charge transfer and photosynthesis. There's also been the suggestion that this is not specific to photosynthesis, but is more generally a question of the arrangement of chromophores in proteins, uh, chromophores being light sensitive molecules that you all will have heard quite a bit about. And um, it's also been suggested that quantum coherent energy and charge transport might play a role in neurons um, and also explain how anesthetics work. And, and electron transport chains, very similar to those found in photosynthesis, are also integral to the functioning of mitochondria. Um, quantum tunneling also appears to be important in the context of biological processes. Um, historically, tunneling was first observed in enzymes and has been shown to contribute to significant rate uh, reaction speed ups. Tunneling has also been applied to the biological context of receptor activation. Um, for example, olfactory receptors have been suggested to use uh, tunneling facilitated by the vibrations of smell molecules. And there's also been some attempts to apply this to um, the action of neurotransmitters. Um, another topic of quantum biology is the radical pair mechanism of um, bird migration, where paired spin states, the, the spin states of paired um, electrons allow birds to navigate using the Earth's magnetic field. But in addition to this specific um, context, there's also been growing interest in radical pairs in other contexts, such as reactive oxygen species. There's also the suggestion that nuclear spin pairs might play a role in the brain. And this is what we will be hearing more about today. Um, I have left out some other points of interest like for the uh, condensates uh, should be clear about that as well. So as we can see, quantum biology is quite well developed on the bench side of things. What isn't well developed is how this knowledge might translate into new therapeutics. So therapies such as photobiomodulation look promising, uh, but are far from mainstream. And magnetic fields have also been shown to mediate stem cell growth and, and neurogenesis but there's still no standardization in terms of what devices to use or what dosages to use. Our speakers will address both quantum bench and potential bedside application. The fundamental physics we'll be hearing about from Matthew, and um, specifically we'll be hearing about spin. And um, spin describes the quantized response of a physical system to a magnetic field. The name is potentially confusing. It's not due to any spinning motion, but rather it's an intrinsic quantum property. And by intrinsic, I just mean uh, properties of matter such as mass or charge, where mass will describe how matter might um, respond to a gravitational field, charge uh, describes how matter will respond to an electric field, and spin describes how quantum systems such as electrons and protons will respond to a magnetic field. So spin has already played an important role in medical technologies as it gave us magnetic resonance imaging, which uses strong magnetic fields and uh, spin relaxation as an imaging tool. And the fundamental science that gave us the MRI is nuclear magnetic resonance, which was first described in 1938 and won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1944. Um, NMR techniques were only developed into, into the medical context in the 70s 
and won the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 2003. Um, in addition to this time lapse, I'm sure there were uh, many potential uh, and practical obstacles to overcome, not least the human element. I read somewhere that uh, there's still a significant proportion of MRIs that are actually canceled due to patient fear and claustrophobia. Um, so spin is a valuable resource in medicine, at least in an imaging capacity, but what about therapeutics? Um, I'm sure we've all heard about uh, free radicals in the medical context um, and the importance of antioxidants. Um, and spin manipulation of paired electron spins called radical pairs can potentially play a role in mitigating reactive oxygen species. We heard last week from um, Wolfgang about how important the balance of um, reactive oxygen species is, um, because aside from being damaging, uh, potentially damaging, they're also very important signaling molecules. And um, this balance can be maintained by chemical means, such as uh, luminol, which we heard about last time, but magnetic fields might also prove useful. Uh, for instance, as they've been shown to mediate stem cell growth and uh, neurogenesis. But it's still unclear how to implement this as a medical intervention. The radical pairs look at the spins of paired electrons, uh, but nuclear spin pairs might also play a role in biological systems, uh, controlling reservoirs of calcium and phosphate ions, which could have implications for bone production, metabolism, and most interestingly, consciousness. But I'll let Matthew tell us more about this after I've introduced him. And then we'll hear from Dave, who is very involved in the field of quantum biology, and will hopefully give us some insights into how to develop these ideas. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Matthew Fisher, who is Professor of Physics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He received his PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Illinois in 1986 and went on to become first a visiting scientist and then a research staff member at IBM TJ Watson Research Center. Matthew joined the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics and the Physics Department of the University of California in 1993. In 2007, he joined Microsoft's Station Q as a research physicist on lead from the UCSB Physics Department. During the academic year 2009 to 2010, Matthew was on the faculty at Caltech, returning to the physics department at UCSB in the summer of 2010. Fisher received the Alan T. Waterman Award bestowed by the National Science Foundation in 1995, um, the National Academy of Sciences Award for Initiatives and in Research in 1997, and the Oliver E. Buckley Prize in Condensed Matter Physics in 2015. He was elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Sciences in 2003 and to the National Academy of Sciences in 2012. Matthew's interests are wide ranging and include condensed matter theory, strongly correlated quantum systems, mock insulators, quantum magnetism and superconductivity, the quantum Hall effect, and uh, quantum neuroscience, quantum dynamics and quantum information. Um, in addition to participating in numerous conferences, schools, and other colloquia, he has published hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific publications. One of these is the reason he is speaking here today. In 2016, he published an intriguing paper about the possibility of quantum processing in the brain using nuclear spin as the hardware. I've had to condense a very impressive 32 page long CV into a short introduction. So I hope I haven't left anything essential out. And um, I'll now hand over to Matthew. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about his novel approach to quantum biology. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to join the uh, seminar series at, at the Guy Foundation. I'd like to thank Jeffrey and Nina uh, for you know, spearheading this. and. Uh, Bethany for you know the kind introduction. Um, let me maybe I'll sorry. Uh, I think I will. Yeah, okay, maybe if you can see my red dot there. Um, okay, so you know I'd like to describe some things I've been thinking about really for the last seven eight years on the possibility of quantum processing in the brain and uh, in the context of this seminar series, um, you know, thinking a little bit about the road to possible therapeutics. And 
In addition to thanking those I've already thanked, I'd like to thank Dave uh, Ecker, um, who has given us some very generous support from IONIS to spearhead a number of experimental uh, forays, which hopefully will shine some light on some of these uh, issues. I'd also like to thank the Heising Simons Foundation for their generous support as well. So quantum processing in the brain, well, the story really uh, started, for me at least, not with uh, quantum mechanics so much as, uh, as with, uh, um, sorry, there, with lithium. Um, so I've been very interested in lithium, not because it's just a very simple atom. Um, lithium is an atom which has two stable isotopes. Lithium-7, which is the abundant isotope, which has three protons and four neutrons in the nucleus, and lithium-6, which has three protons and three neutrons uh, in the nucleus. And that's the less abundant naturally occurring uh, lithium. Both of these uh, lithium isotopes are stable, um, and they occur, occur naturally at this 92% and 8% abundance levels. But what's remarkable about lithium, besides this being a simple atom, or in the context of biology, uh, lithium plus iron, uh, it's a remarkable drug um, for bipolar disorder. And I have some personal experience with this, as well as some experience from close friends and relatives. Um, and it can be a very, very effective drug. And one of the, in some instances, one of the only drugs that really can temper mania in, a, in, a, in an effective way. And it's been used in this context since 1970, when, when it was approved by the FDA. So I've been very interested in psychiatric pharmaceuticals for many years, and lithium in particular. And you know, I was starting to think about how does lithium uh, work? And really, you can ask the question, how do any psychiatric medications work? And ultimately, if you really want to understand psychiatric medications, the fundamental underpinnings of their efficacy, one ultimately needs to understand, I believe, the bio biochemical and biological underpinnings of sentience. Because these psychiatric pharmaceuticals, what they do is they modulate one's, the tenor of one's conscious state. Uh, that's maybe, to put it in a bit of a loaded way, but that's really what, what one's thinking about. And uh, if one no, has no clue to what underlies that sentience, it, it's going to be difficult to, in a systematic way at least, to, to um, uh, design in a controlled uh, fashion psychiatric medications. But what's remarkable about lithium is an experiment that uh, occurred in 1986, which I'll very briefly mention, where the experimentalist, um, uh, it was a psychiatrist who was very interested in lithium, uh, studying the effects of lithium on, on rodents, on rats. And the experiment was to feed the two different lithium isotopes to rats. Um, a 95% purified lithium-6, which is a less abundant lithium, but you can purchase that, or 99% purified lithium-7. And as I say, the experiment was to feed rats lithium isotopes and look for any behavioral difference, differences. Uh, so the, the question was, is there a lithium isotope effect on rat behavior? Now, much of the experiment was looking at the mothering behavior of rats and also the development of the, um, uh, the pups. Um, but it was really the, uh, this table on the mothering behavior of rats which caught my attention. Um, so what's shown here is basically they had 24 rats divided into four groups. Uh, they had the control group, which they didn't feed lithium to. They had the group which they fed naturally occurring lithium in their diets, uh, purified lithium-7, and then purified lithium-6. And uh, what uh, they looked at was various behaviors which they, which are really qualitative behaviors like nest building, nursing, grooming of pups, and or grooming of self, um, and state of alertness certainly is is uh, is not easy to quantify. And and basically they didn't and uh, uh, define they didn't um, offer really any precise quantification in these words that describe these behaviors of the mothering of the rats. And what one sees is that. Uh, in the columns lithium-7 or naturally occurring lithium, which is a bit, uh, essentially lithium-7, um, predominantly lithium-7, that the, uh, the, the nursing, grooming of pups, retrieval of pups and so forth uh, were damned, damped down relative to the controls who are quote, all average. And you might well ask what, what that really means. 
but uh, we can just read the words here. So infrequent grooming of pups, grooming of self was absent and so forth. But it was this lithium-6 column, and lithium-6 again is this, uh, is a rare lithium isotope, which was purified and fed to the rats. Um, that apparently sort of amped up the mothering behavior of the rats and the nest building was excessive, nursing very frequent, retrieval of pups was excessive. Um, I don't know about that. Um, it's probably good to have uh, excessive retrieval if you're a pup. Um, or reaching for food was average, state of alertness very high. So if one takes this at face value, which I'm not sure one should, because I think it's you know, a bit suspect, it suggests though that one less neutron in lithium-6 relative to lithium-7 seems to make a big difference. Um, now, you know, I've been very skeptical about the results of this experiment. Uh, it was done a long, you know, fairly long time ago, over 30 years. And it, as I say, didn't really have any uh, quantifiable data, as far as I could tell, certainly at least on the mothering behavior, you know, which was really uh, just summarized in this table. So sort of motivated by that, um, Aaron Ettenberg here at UCSB uh, tried to do, redo a set of experiments looking at lithium isotope effects on rat behavior. And the model that was taken uh, to study was the ketamine rat model of mania. So it turns out that if you take rats and you inject them with ketamine, that they start running around more. They, tr they travel more, they, 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 they're more active physically. Um, and um, so, but it was known before we did this experiment that if you take rats who have been treated with lithium, that the lithium counteracts the ketamine induced mania. So it acts as a you know, modulation of this, of, of this you know, ketamine induced mania in the rats. Uh, and what uh, Aaron Ettenberg found was that lithium six when fed to the rats uh, was even more effective, at least in this time frame between about 15 minutes and 40 minutes in modulating and damping the ketamine induced mania. So the lithium six rats uh, um, were more um, calm, if you will. So lithium six, you know, appears at least in this rat model of mania to be more effective at treating mania than lithium seven or the parent compound. And it's the parent compound, which is predominantly lithium seven, which is of course what's used therapeutically, you know, throughout the world in treating bipolar disorder. So this is all very suggestive and uh, one can start thinking, well, how on earth does, you know, the different two different lithium isotopes have such a dramatic difference in the effects on uh, rodent behavior? Um, and, you know, in the context of this seminar series, one can ask, is this a classical effect or a quantum effect? Now, the classical effect would involve the mass difference between lithium-6 and lithium-7, and in particular, because lithium-6 is lighter, it dif would diffuse a little more readily. Although in water, the lithium ion is strongly solvated by uh, water molecules. And so if one measures, as it was done in this experiment, the uh, lithium-6 and lithium-7 diffusion constants, they differ only by a few parts in a thousand. So it doesn't seem like this would be a, a, you know, a dramatic effect. Um, now one can then turn to the possibility of you know, quantum mechanics having some role in this lithium isotope effects. And, Quantum tunneling, uh, if, you, if you look at a quantum tunneling of a quantum object through a barrier, you know, it's known that the tunneling rate depends you know, rather sensitively on the mass of the uh, particle that's doing the quantum tunneling. And uh, it's conceivable uh, that through ion channels, maybe a potassium or sodium ion channel, uh, that lithium, uh, which squeezes through, has to have a little bit of quantum tunneling right as it goes to the most tight constriction in those ion channels speculating here, of course. Um, and if that were the case, then lithium-6 maybe would be taken up into tissue a little more uh, effectively. Uh, and so this is one experiment that one would like to look at is differential tissue uptake. Um, but there's another very big difference between lithium-6 and lithium-7 that involves the nuclear spins. Um, and it turns out that if you take lithium-6 and lithium-7 and solvate them in water, you can look at using nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, the lithium-6 relaxation, nuclear spin relaxation time, um, the time it takes, if you will, for the lithium-6 nucleus to entangle with water. And what one finds is that the lithium-7 
nucleus spin relaxation time is around 10 seconds, but the lithium-6 nucleus spin is very isolated and its relaxation time you know, is a whopping uh, five minutes. And you know, when I saw this, it got me thinking, you know, the kind of perhaps you know, rather crazy thought, um, you know, is it conceivable then that there could be some role of nuclear spins in, in modulating sentience or in affecting the you know, processing, neural processing in the brain? So that brings me to the title, quantum processing in the brain. And in the modern parlance, one would maybe ask, you know, are we a quantum computer? Um, are we quantum computers or just, uh, not just, but you know, very complex and intricate uh, uh, classical computational machines in our brain? Now the standard reply, at least when I mentioned this to physicists, is that certainly not. Uh, there's no way that there's quantum processing in the brain because the body is too hot for quantum mechanical effects. And what I was really talking about here is quantum mechanical effects, which have some role on, you know, sort of macroscopic time scales. So I'm not talking about um, the electron spins in, uh, you know, avian magneto uh, uh, navigation, where one has to have the electron spins coherence times of the order of microseconds. So I'm talking about really um, nuclear spin, uh, you know, quantum coherence times of order seconds, minutes, or even longer. So the body is too hot for quantum effects, but this assumes thermal equilibrium. And if you look at the worldwide attempts to build quantum computers, one thing that they are not is in thermal equilibrium. And they require isolation. The quantum computers you know, it, it are isolated from the environment and otherwise the quantum computation is just breaks down due to the you know, decoherence from the environment. So you can ask then if you come back to the biological context, uh, if quantum processing would require isolated qubits, uh, the what is isolated from the wet environment in biology, um, and uh, I've already you know motivated nuclear spins, but it turns out nuclear spins are the most isolated quantum mechanical degree of freedom in the wet environment of of, of biology. The nuclear spins are a property, as Bettany was describing, of protons and neutrons which have what's called a spin a half. Um, and the nucleus of atoms is made of protons and neutrons. So the nuclear spin uh, is a property of some nuclei as well. And if you take table salt, sodium chloride, and you dissolve it in water, the sodium ions and the chloride ions separate and the sodium ions are floating around in the water. And then you can do nuclear magnetic resonance uh, to measure the nuclear spin uh, relaxation times. Um, th these are in the nuclear NMR parlance, the T1 and T2 times, which are basically the same. And they're around a 10th of a second, which is you know, a very long time on the scales of microscopic times, but on human time scales, that's pretty short. But I already mentioned that this that for lithium-7, the decoherence time is some two orders of magnitude. And for lithium-6, it's a number of order of magnitude even longer. So the lithium-6 nuclear spin is very isolated. And so you know, this started me on this um, sojourn to try to explore whether it's conceivable that quantum processing with nuclear spins might be operative in the brain. Now, uh, lithium is a trace element. And it's, uh, unless it's taken therapeutic, it's at basically a micromolar concentration. Uh, when one takes it therapeutically, the therapeutic range is around a millimolar, so it's a thousand times or more higher. Um, but you know, if one wants to ask about nuclear spins operative in the brain, uh, one wants to be thinking about nuclear spins for elements besides lithium, which is really, as I say, just a trace element and is not, not there in natural uh, uh, biological conditions. Um, so what I set out to do was to ask, is it possible that there is another uh, a biological uh, atom, a common biological element, which has a isolated nuclear spin, which could serve as a possible a neural qubit? And the approach I took was basically one of reverse engineering, um, listing the kind of uh, conditions that would have to be uh, met by biology in order to, uh, for evolution to have evolved in such a way that one has neural uh, qubits, which are being used in some quantum processing. So first and foremost, one needs a common biological element with a very isolated nuclear spin um, to serve as the neural qubit. 
We, one will need mechanisms for quantum entangling nuclear spins and mechanisms for quantum processing with the qubits and methods for quantum biochemical transduction. And I'll at least touch on these uh, shortly. So the question is, can such conditions be fulfilled in biology? Well, the first step then is to identify a possible neural qubit. And so one's looking for a common biological atom with a long nuclear spin entanglement time. And it turns out that the nuclear spins are most isolated when they have the smallest possible spin, spin a half, since in that case, they're sensitive only to magnetic fields and not to electric field gradients, which are larger and fluctuating in the dipole moments of water molecules and other dipolar molecules in biology. So one wants an atom with a nuclear spin a half, one wants that atom to be in a small molecule that can tumble in water um, to, um, uh, in, to, to um, have what's called uh, emotional narrowing, uh, where the magnetic fields felt by the nuclear spins would be fluctuating very rapidly um, and uh, would be sort of averaged out uh, for very first approximation. And ideally, when we want other atoms in the molecule to have spin zero. So here I've listed the common biochemical elements, all with one letter, chinops, carbon hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and the bioelectrical ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, and magnesium. So which of these has nuclear spin a half? That's what, you know, I asked. Um, and besides the proton, there's only one common biological element with nuclear spin a half, and that's phosphorus. So uh, phosphorus 31 nucleus, it seems to me, uh, as far as quantum processing on you know, sort of human time scales in the brain is the only possible neural qubit that I can think of. And so that's what uh, we started to follow. Um, so let's look into that, the phosphorus nucleus, the phosphorus atom. Now, where does phosphorus occur in biology? It's essentially always in the phosphate ion uh, surrounded by a tetrahedral arrangement of oxygens. Um, and one can take sodium phosphate and dissolve it in water and measure the relaxation of the phosphorus nuclear spin uh, solvated in water. And one finds a time scale, which is you know, really fairly modest around one second. Um, and the reason it's not longer than this is that protons, positively charged protons in water tend to bind to the negatively charged oxygens and the proton and phosphorus nuclear spins uh, interact uh, and this decoheres and relaxes the phosphorus nuclear spin. So in order to protect the phosphorus nuclear spin to get longer decoherence times, one has to find or ask whether or not there's an, another biological cation, like the proton, but different, which can outcompete the proton in binding to the phosphate. And you can start looking at the biological cations, like sodium plus potassium plus, but those two don't really take much part in uh, uh, chemical reactions, uh, they're more, you know, bioelectrical ions. Uh, magnesium is kind of, uh, you know, works both ways, but the really uh, the, the most likely um, possible biological cation which can protect the phosphorus nuclear spins is calcium. And the hint here is that bone is calcium phosphate. And in 1970, a man called Posner was thinking about the nucleation of, of bone or, or hydroxyapatite, uh, which is the bone mineral or bone crystal uh, from the melt where you start with uh, calcium and phosphate ions. Uh, and he posited uh, based on really X-ray structure, uh, structure measurements of um, uh, hydroxyapatite that there was a a uh, pre-nucleation cluster, which now is called the posenum cluster or the posenum molecule, um, made of nine calcium ions and six phosphate ions. And this is uh, about one nanometer in diameter, so it's very small. And it's nice here that the calcium ions don't have any nuclear spin and the oxygen ions don't have any nuclear spin. So the only nuclear spins in the posenum molecule are the six phosphorus nuclear spins. Now we've been doing some experiments to try to detect the posenum molecule, which is not all, altogether easy. And the best way to try to do that is dynamic light scattering, which we have done. And we have evidence there that there's a nanoscale molecule in vitro uh, in calcium phosphate uh, um, solutions. Um, but one wants to do cryogenic electron microscopy and other studies to really, and nuclear magnetic resonance studies to try to you know, look at the posenum molecule in more detail. But if one looks theoretically, one can try to understand the 
phosphorus 31 coherence times. Um, and one expects these to be very long in Posner molecule on the scales of hours or even up to a day. And that's basically because the Posner molecule is you know, nearly spherical and it will tumble very rapidly in water and you'll get a lot of emotional narrowing and the phosphorus nuclear spins are very protected inside the Posner molecule as well. So the decoherence times could be, you know, really macroscopic um, time scales, you know, human time scales. So the Posner molecule seems to be ideal for quantum mechanical storage, for storage of quantum information, and possibly for quantum processing, which would be necessary. Now, where do Posner mo molecules occur in vivo, uh, or do they occur in vivo? Well, the place where they're most likely to occur is in mitochondria. Um, now, of course, mitochondria's main function is the production of ATP, but it turns out, perhaps lesser well known, is that mitochondria buffer and release calcium into the cell. So they take in calcium and they release it in some you know, precise timed way when the calcium is needed uh, in the, inside the in, intracellular milieu. Um, and inside the mitochondria, you can actually get high concentrations of calcium phosphate. And the calcium phosphate exists as some sort of sludge. Uh, sometimes when you dry out mitochondria, you can see, in fact, little granules of calcium phosphate. Um, and uh, so that's where the calcium phosphate, a lot of calcium phosphate is going to uh, be present. Now, mitochondria are, of course, extremely interesting um, for many different reasons. Uh, but from the point of view of possible uh, quantum mechanics, um, one of the things which is interesting about them is that they fuse and fission and they move, move around inside the cell as well. And so the conjecture is that Posner molecule formation and melting inside mitochondrial entangled non-locally mitochondrial networks via fusion and fission might be uh, operative uh, in the brain. So, you know, I can go, you can go onto YouTube and get movies or you can make movies if you have the mitochondrial specialists of, uh, of mitochondria. And what's shown here um, is a fluorescent image. Um, these big blobs are nucleus of some of the neurons. And if you, I don't know how easily you can see this, but basically uh, these wires are uh, microtubules and these little beads running on the wires are um, mitochondria. And you know, if you follow a particular little mitochondria element, what you see is it's not always just moving in one direction. It changes direction. It fuses with other mitochondria. Um, and then it splits apart again. And so there seems to be you know, some sort of elaborate mitochondrial dance going on uh, inside, um, inside these neurons. And you know, why is that? What's the biological function of having these mitochondria moving around? Now, of course, you do want mitochondria to, to be taken to different parts of the cell where energy is needed, uh, but this doesn't seem to be such a concerted directional uh, flow. So, uh, well, okay, so what about quantum entangling Posner spins? Well, so if two Posner molecules approach and bind one another and then unbind and separate, uh, the Posner molecules can become quantum entangled. Um, and you can ask about possible quantum processing with Posners. Uh, well, the entanglement can influence non-locally uh, pair binding. So if Posner molecules A and A prime have chemically bonded and separated, so their nuclear spins become entangled, and Posner molecules B and B prime have become chemically bonded and then separated, so their nuclear spins are entangled. If at some later time, Posner molecules A and B chemically bond, then A prime and B prime are more likely to chemically bond. There's, there, there are uh, correlations, non-local correlations that would be uh, between the chemical bonding of two Posner molecules and these other two Posner molecules, provided one has these uh, non-local uh, spooky action in the distance quantum entanglement. Um, now, even if all of this is going on, uh, nuclear spins entangling um, um, and moving in micro mitochondria, which are fissioning and fusing and so forth, um, unless there is some quantum to biochemical transduction, it would all be for naught. I mean, basically one needs the nuclear spin states to modulate chemical reaction rates uh, to have a downstream biochemical effect. And uh, you can argue that pair binding of two Posner molecules will influence their dissolution, uh, which occurs um, in the more, uh, when, you know, as pH is varied. Um, and if a Posner molecule dissolves, it releases its free calcium and free phosphate. 
And if that free calcium is then liberated from the mitochondria into the cell, um, it can start stimulating you know, biochemical activity. And in particular, if the mitochondria are near the synapses, uh, the biochemical activity that can be stimulated is you know, neurotransmitter release. So the released calcium ions then possibly modulate neural activity, uh, maybe creating a quantum network that coexists with the neural network. Now, with apologies to those who have seen this before, uh, can't resist showing this, but boson molecules, even if they don't occur in nature, they occur in Hollywood. Um, and this is a clip I've uh, got from uh, the ant and the wasp. Uh, this is Paul uh, Rudd. Uh, and I'll turn up the volume and, and play this little link. Uh, but they're discussing, as you'll see, if I can get this uh, playing. It's incredible. You're linked to Janet. It's quantum entanglement between the quantum states of posner molecules in your brains. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? Okay, well, us quantum physicists like quantum in front of everything and quantum behind everything as well. So um, anyway, um, so you know, basically what I've been telling is really is a story. And at best, at this stage, it's a partly formed picture puzzle. And what are needed and what we've been focusing our efforts on in the last three, four, five years are experiments to try to discern the precise shapes of the various pieces uh, and to see if they uh, fit together. And towards this end, we'll be doing experiments which are supported by both Ionis and Heising Simons Foundation. And uh, for example, in the Ionis projects, uh, we're looking at cryogenic electron microscopy, trying to uh, see whether boson molecules exist in solution uh, conditions in vitro. Uh, looking at mitochondrial proteomics, which I'll mention at the, right at the end in, in a few minutes, uh, electrical activity of neurons, uh, mitochondrial brain physics, um, related set of projects are trying to do phosphorus 31 nucleomagnetic resonance, looking for a nuclear spin dynamics, um, possibly in posing the molecules. We have some enzymology experiments going uh, which are look, trying to look for uh, biochemical, uh, quantum to biochemical transduction and some experiments on mitochondrial uh, transport. And, you know, basically, uh, you know, what we've set out on is a, you know, very challenging um, uh, set of, uh, you know, conceptual uh, ideas. And there's uh, a, a large range of scales over which we really have to probe uh, the biological and biochemical environment, um, all the way from you know nuclear spins to organisms, um, and the vertical glue in this story that holds together uh, that uh, th this thread of um, phenomena, different uh, complexity scales and length and time scales, uh, is calcium phosphate. Um, and I've already mentioned the phosphorus thirty one nuclear spins, uh, posner clusters, uh, the a protein biochemistry of calcium phosphate, which I'll mention shortly, uh, and the mitochondrial cellular processing, uh, which interested in that uh, modulating calcium phosphate. But the other vertical glue that I want to mention and come back to now are lithium isotopes. Um, and I want to describe a couple of experiments uh, looking for lithium isotope dependence on not on rodent behavior, but on other biochemical uh, and uh, uh, processes. Um, so let me uh, do that. So basically, you know, if you start looking for lithium isotope effects in biology, they appear on many different biological phenomena. Um, and I'll just I'll just mention two experiments which we've been working on recently uh, in vitro. Excuse me. Uh, one can look for the effects of lithium isotopes on calcium phosphate precipitation. If you just take calcium and phosphate and put them in solution under the right pH conditions, calcium phosphate starts precipitating. And if you've added lithium, you can ask about, is there a lithium isotope dependence on that precipitation? Uh, one can look at lithium isotope dependencies on the subcellular level on the mitochondrial release of calcium phosphate. And I'll just mention an experiment on that. Uh, one can also look at, at lithium isotope dependencies on the multicellular level or neuronal si signal propagation. And uh, there's preliminary hints that, that, uh, that there is a lithium isotope, isotope dependence there as well. Uh, in uh, other work supported by ionos by Luca Turin, who some of you might know, uh, he's got an experiment on uh, looking for lithium isotope effects on Drosophila, uh, Drosophila 
uh, proteomics. So the protein expression of uh, Drosophila uh, fed either lithium-6 or lithium-7 isotope. Okay, and I've already mentioned the, the evidence that uh, there's an organism level of lithium isotope dependence in, in rodents. So here is just some data that's very recent from about a month ago. This is actually unpublished, but that's okay. Um, um, so this is, uh, one takes basically a test tube, um, puts in the salt concentrations which are appropriate uh, for the uh, intracellular fluid, um, potassium uh, at the 100 millimolar or 200 millimolar level, uh, calcium chloride, sodium phosphate, someone's adding the calcium and phosphorus, uh, working at pH of 7.6 in this case. And one is doing what's called dynamic light scattering experiments, where you basically shine light off your, the sample, your solution, and you measure the scattered intensity of the light. Um, and that is sensitive to the precipitation and conglomeration um, of, of calcium phosphate. And so look at this right plot here. And what's plotted on the vertical axis is the intensity of the dynamic light scattering signal. Um, and as a function of time after the calcium has been added into the solution. And uh, there are uh, three Curves, big error bars, admittedly. Um, uh, here, uh, the bottom one is potassium chloride. And then what was done in this experiment was to replace potassium with, on the one hand, lithium-7, and on the other hand, lithium-6. And what one finds, you know, well within these error bars is that the lithium-6 uh, uh, chloride, uh, the, it, it somehow aids in the precipitation of calcium phosphate. So there's some role that lithium is playing, first of all, in calcium phosphate precipitation. And lithium-6 and lithium-7 have a diff different uh, effect on the uh, intensity or the, the amount of calcium phosphate which is precipitating in the test tube. Um, so this is something we're gonna be exploring in much more detail, uh, looking at um, mass spectroscopy to see how much lithium is actually incorporated in the calcium phosphate trying to do nuclear magnetic resonance studies, looking at both lithium-6 and lithium-7 nuclear spins, as well as phosphorus nuclear spins, and trying to explore and understand why lithium uh, and its lithium isotope is such a uh, you know, dramatic effect on the precipitation of calcium uh, phosphate. Uh, now we can look at this other experiment um, from several, a couple of years ago, but we're, which we're revisiting, the lithium isotope effects on mitochondrial calcium release. So I've already mentioned that inside the uh, mitochondria, there's calcium and phosphate uh, stores. Uh, and if you separate mitochondria from the cells and um, add calcium, it, then calcium is taken into the mitochondria. And if you have fluorescence, calcium fluorescence molecules outside the mitochondria, you can basically measure how much mitochondria is sucked into the, how much calcium, excuse me, is sucked into the mitochondria. And what happens is you get a lot of the calcium is sucked into the mitochondria and it starts sort of slowly leaking out. And then at some point it kind of ejects a lot of calcium. There's a large calcium uh, release uh, from the mitochondria. And this occurs on quite long time scales, it's too, too small to read here, but this is five minutes, 10 minutes and 15 minutes. Uh, so the timing of the calcium release gives some indication of the calcium phosphate formation and stability inside mitochondria because what's released is free calcium. Um, now, uh, what was done in this experiment was to replace the potassium in the buffer by either lithium-6 or lithium-7. And what was found is that there was a strong uh, uh, lithium isotope dependence uh, found on the mitochondrial calcium release. That in the lithium-6 buffer, the calcium phosphate uh, was held in the mitochondria for uh, you know, significantly longer times before it was released as free calcium. So that's actually, you know, in some sense, fairly consistent with this in vitro study of dynamic light scattering on calcium phosphate precipitation, where lithium-6 stabilized larger uh, clusters of uh, calcium phosphate. Okay, well, let me start wrapping up. I've already shown you this uh, experiment on uh, lithium isotope dependence on rat behavior. Um, so one can, you know, naturally ask, and I've been setting this up throughout the talk, you know, could lithium isotope be a therapeutic? Um, and I have a patent entitled Treatment for Depression and Other Mental Conditions with Synthetic Isotope Modified Lithium. 
Um, now, you know, to get a patent doesn't mean that what you're claiming in your patent is necessarily correct, um, but uh, what one would be interested in is, you know, feeding the rare lithium-6 isotope to patients and asking whether there's a, a differential effect on the mania as there was in the treatment of rats. Now, I've already mentioned that bipolar disorder is a, you know, it's pretty common uh, disorder. And for many people, they only respond to lithium. I mean, it's quite remarkable. There are other mood stabilizers, but they oftentimes less effective than lithium. And there are hints that lithium might be effective in Alzheimer's and other cognitive and psychiatric elements that seem to respond to lithium as well. So it, it's quite effective in you know, neurological and psychiatric uh, response. Now, there are downsides of lithium. Long-term lithium use affects kidney function. And oops, and long-term lithium use can affect uh, teeth. Uh, a friend of mine who's been on lithium for a number of decades um, has had problems with her teeth, and um, you know this is not uncommon. Um, and it, this is perhaps not surprising since the teeth uh, are made from calcium phosphate, uh, and lithium kind of gets absorbed into calcium phosphate and can modulate the precipitation of calcium phosphate in some way. Okay, so this is uh, you know a suggestion for one possible uh, therapeutic. Another one that comes out of these studies uh, and these, this way of uh, this this tra train of the thinking is trying to identify proteins that regulate calcium phosphate inside mitochondria. So if the calcium phosphate you know um, uh, it, uh, regulation is important there. As Dave Ecker has emphasized to us, there are likely proteins which are specialized to sort of controlling the association and disassociation of, of uh, calcium phosphate and of posner molecules. Um, now, mitochondrial dysfunctions, of course, cause a great variety of diseases, um, and many neurodegenerative diseases show abnormal mitochondrial dynamics. Um, in some of these diseases, the mitochondria fission or fuse excessively. And I've already mentioned mitochondria are dynamic stores of calcium phosphate and known to serve as calcium buffer systems. So what we're doing in this experiment funded by Dave Ecker through Ionis is to try to isolate and identify proteins that regulate aggregation and dissolution of calcium phosphate species inside the mitochondria. So if we can find out which proteins are responsible for, as I say, for regulating uh, calcium phosphate, and if the calcium phosphate regulation, which is presumably, you know, has an important biochemical role, uh, perhaps modulating the fissioning and fusing of mitochondria or other mitochondrial function, uh, if one could identify these proteins and one could then start upregulating or downregulating these proteins, uh, you know, pushing towards on the, you know, long time scale, uh, possible, a possible therapeutic. Um, so, okay, let me, let me just finish there since I've already run over quite long and thank you for your attention. And again, thanks to, to Dave for the generous support from Ionis. It's now my, my pleasure to um, introduce uh, Dave Ecker, who's co-founder and vice president of strategic innovation for Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Um, he received his PhD in biochemistry from Utah State University in 1982 before a two-year chemistry fellowship at the University of California, Berkeley. He went on to co-found three companies, Ionis uh, Pharmaceuticals, Abyss Biosciences, which was acquired by Abbott in 2009, um, and Janus Science. His teams have won well over $250 million in government and NGO grants and contracts over a 20-year period. Major accomplish accomplishments include the development of new drug discovery paradigms, uh, antisense, and a small molecule FDA cleared antibacterial drug. Diagnostic technologies known as the IBIS T5000, Eridica, and a point of care diagnostic device known as the mobile analysis platform. His current responsibilities include identifying and implementing new technologies at IONIS for precision genetic medicine. In parallel with his company responsibilities, he has spent many years on advisory panels for multiple government agencies. Dave has over 35 years of experience in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries, over 140 peer-reviewed publications with more than 24,000 citations, 
and over 100 issued US patents. Among other things, his publications represent contributions and innovations in the field of ubiquitin and the early discovery of how targeted protein degradation works. His group was the first in the pharmaceutical industry to consider the ubiquitin system and as a target for drug discovery. He's also been awarded a number of honors and prizes that would take me too long to list, but include the 2005 R&D 100 award and the 2009 Wall Street Journal Technology Innovation Award Gold Medal winner, which is the top honor of the year. He also received the 2009 Top 10 Innovations in Life Science of the Year from the scientists. Uh, this is a very attenuated version of his CV, um, which is uh, very impressive. Um, and I'm really looking forward to his insights into how quantum biology might be leveraged towards pharmaceutical innovation and development. Okay, so as you've heard, I'm funding quantum biology, you know, four different laboratories that Professor Fisher is coordinating and a couple of others. And so I'm going to walk you through the logic for why. Right. Why are we doing this? I, I'm a, you know, Ionis is a pharma company, and I've been attending these seminars now all throughout the pandemic, the UCLA version and this version, and, and uh, um, learning. So Ionis is about making sick people well. Uh, we're a company that's now 32 years old. We were founded by and are continuously run by scientists. The current CEO did his PhD in my lab in the 80s. And um, uh, we're about precision genetic medicines. And so I'm going to explain uh, what that is. And you know, we have a culture of continuous innovation. OK, so if I click here and I change. So um, what we do is use oligonucleotides as medicines. And I'm sure everybody knows that um, Genetic information is stored in DNA, and then that gets transcribed into RNA, and then that gets translated into proteins. And then what most of the pharmaceutical industry tries to do is to make drugs that bind to proteins, usually to inhibit them. Likewise, monoclonal antibodies are targeted to proteins, which cause disease for some reason. What we do is uh, try to use the benefits of Watson-Crick interactions and make an oligonucleotide type drug that would bind to the RNA with the, with the specificity of Watson-Crick pairing and, and then prevent the RNA from being translated into the protein in the first place. Uh, so um, uh, the concept here is rather than inhibit the protein, let's stop the protein from being made. And the, the, the little slogan we used to have in the early days was we, we try to kill the messenger. Okay, so that's the, that's the premise for the company. Now, this premise was considered uh, crazy in 1989, and, and we were ridiculed uh, uh, tremendously when we, every time we brought this up, wherever we brought this up. And so, you know, nothing like this had ever been done before. How, how, how are you gonna make oligonucleotides into drugs? You know, you've got these issues of the stability, how can they get into cells, how could they work? Uh, uh, what about their toxicities? How are you gonna manufacture them? Back in the day, I had a DNA synthesizer in my lab and it cost hundreds of dollars to make a milligram. So how are you gonna ever manufacture these things on the scale needed to make, I mean, all this stuff uh, was out there. And so, you know, it took us a really long time to work through all this. And it's not that relevant to the topic at the moment. So I'll just talk about one thing. I'll just talk about stability and distribution in the body. So, you know, limitations of DNA, natural RNA and DNA make uh, poor drugs. If you put them into the uh, bloodstream, they are degraded almost immediately. Uh, and so uh, we had to look at the molecule and say, how can we practice medicinal chemistry on oligonucleotides in a way that would make them suitable as drugs? And if you look at the structure of, of nucleic acids, there's the heterocyclic base, the A's, G's, C's, and T's. There's the sugar. There's the phosphate linker between the, the nucleotides. And so what we decided to do very early on, we knew we would have to do this, was we invested in medicinal chemistry. And we've had no less than 50 medicinal chemists working on oligonucleotide chemistry now for 32 years. And you know, when people say hundreds and hundreds of anything, it's usually an exaggeration. 
but uh, uh, our chemists and others from the other companies that have come along have literally published hundreds and hundreds of publications around the medicinal chemistry of, of lig ligonucleotides to, to bring to bear the properties that would make them uh, useful in, in the body as, as drugs. And so I'm going to just skip fast forward right away to where we are now. So uh, I have money to fund quantum biology because of the money that the drugs make now. We have three marketed products and a bunch of phase three clinical trials and a bunch of phase one and phase two trials for a whole variety of important diseases like ALS and heart disease, uh, hypertension, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, but the one drug that stands out above all is this one called Spinraza. It's the one and only really blockbuster product in precision genetic medicine that, that's, that's out there. And so let me explain the disease a little bit. So Spinraza treats spinal muscular atrophy, which is an autosomal recessive disease. And you folks will know from high school biology that uh, we have two chromosomes for, uh, you know, each of our chromosomes are exist in pairs. And if one of the chromosomes has a bad gene, you know, one that doesn't do what it's supposed to do, uh, it's often not a problem because you have your other chromosome which has a good gene, right? And so you, you make your, what you need from this one and, and you don't get it from that one and it's usually all right. Not always, but sometimes it's, it's, it's not all right, but usually it's all right. If a, if, if a man encounters a woman who also has that same mistake, when they then have children, one out of the four child statistically is likely to get the two bad genes and can't make any of the product. And depending upon how important the product is, it could be a mild disease or a very severe disease. Two of the children will be carriers, uh, not affected, and, a, and another child here might be uh, uh, get both good genes and then is not even a carrier. But for a rare genetic disease, usually the parents have no clue that they are carrying this bad gene. Uh, and it's just by bad luck, two of them that, that have the same mistake get together and, and then this happens. And, and when it happens for a disease like spinal muscular atrophy, it comes as a real gut punch to the parents. I mean, they, they, they had never seen it coming. There, there was no history of this in their families ever. And, and here's what they get slammed with. Click here. Uh, uh, so this is a spinal muscular atrophy baby. And, and they're born uh, apparent, you know, apparently healthy and normal. And as the weeks progress, they, they stop moving their arms and legs and they're not able to roll and they're never able to sit. And sooner or later, they'll make their way, uh, the parents will make their way to a pediatric neurologist who will run some tests and, and give them the worst news they've ever gotten in their lives, that, um, that their baby is not going to survive because of spinal muscular atrophy. And there's nothing that we can do about it. It's just, it's just not treatable. Um, let me introduce you to Cameron uh, over here. Cameron is an SMA patient. This was a picture from his seventh birthday. And you can Google and find out about Cameron. His mother posts his progress on a web page called Hope for Cameron. And Cameron was born with spinal muscular atrophy and some damage had occurred. And, and he entered the first clinical trial for Spinraza, our, our, our drug. And uh, uh, he's, he's, he's not perfectly normal. Uh, some damage was done before he got on the drug. And what happens is for these patients, the generation of patients who got on it um, after some damage were done is, it can't go back and fix previous damage. It, it does a little bit, they get a little bit better but uh, they, it pretty much freezes their disease where, where it is. And so if you go on the webpage now, I mean, he's able to play soccer, but you know, his father has to take him around to, to be able to do that. And so uh, you know, he goes to school, he's well liked, he could play piano keys, and, and this is a, obviously a big deal for this family. So now let me introduce you to the Lee family of North Carolina. And, and, and their, their journey with spinal muscular atrophy is, is really interesting is what happened. That They have five children here. The first born was Jocelyn, and she was born with the disease, 
and uh, there was no Spinraza, and she passed away uh, after a few years, and um, it was tragic, of course. Then there were these two boys uh, uh, next, and they may be carriers, they may not be, but they're unaffected by the disease, so, so far, so good. This next child over here in the wheelchair equipped with the ventilator uh, uh, was um, a, a spinal muscular atrophy baby, and somewhere along the line, Spinraza became available, and um, uh, his disease was halted, but you know he'll never be able to breathe. So it, it's kind of tragic and, and very tragic. Um, this little girl on the right also has spinal muscular atrophy. But because they knew this was in their family, uh, they did a diagnosis in utero. And then when she was born, she got on Spinraza like within two weeks of, of being born. And uh, she is by all metrics, a perfectly normal child. Uh, she, she, this picture was taken, I think she was three in this picture. And uh, I just Googled yesterday to check to see how she's doing. Uh, this family is sort of all over the media in North Carolina. Um, I saw videos of her like riding a bike with no training wheels, you know, which my four-year-old grandson still doesn't do, right? Uh, and, and she's running around and, and it, it, it's quite an interesting slice through a family's history where there was no useful therapeutic for the, the disease. There was one that came a little too late before damage had occurred and one that came uh, 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 just in time. The Spinraza was approved by FDA uh, like a couple of months before uh, 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 this one was born. And so I've told you about the journey of three patients and two families, but Spinraza is now approved in 50 countries worldwide and uh, well over 12,000 patients have been treated uh, and, and have, have their own stories. And so, you know, th this, is, this is a really great example of what precision genetic medicine can do. And I'm gonna dig into a little bit, oh, before I go on, the, 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 the person uh, more than any other who deserves credit for this is this fellow here, Frank Bennett is my colleague. He was the co-founder of the company and uh, he led the scientific project for Spinraza. This is his collaborator, Adrian Craner from Cold Spring Harbor. And, and together they collaborated and worked out the logic for how we would use precision genetic medicine to fix this. Uh, uh, to their left and right is a family with a smiling muscular atrophy child. This is Ann Wojcicki, uh, who's the CEO of 23andMe. And this fellow over here is an actor. Uh, uh, I think his name is Orlando Bloom. I'm not sure what he's has acted in. But, um, the Breakthrough Prize is something that Frank and Adrian were awarded in 2018 for this accomplishment. And it's like a Silicon Valley version of the Nobel Prize. All the billionaires got together and they said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could give a prize to breakthroughs in science and treat the scientists like, you know, Academy Award winners with galas and celebrities. And, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting concept. And, and, uh, if you ever want to see like a fish out of water, you know, my, my friend Frank is um, uh, a sort of a humble country boy, you know, wears flannel shirts all the time and fishes and, you know, put him in uh, a gala with a bunch of uh, supermodels and Hollywood movie stars. It's, it, it, it's kind of amusing. Um, if, if you want to learn about this whole story, the history of the company, how it came to be leading up to Spinraza, the notion of using oligonucleotides as therapeutics. Uh, there was a, a reporter from Nature Biotechnology that recorded a series of 10 podcasts. And if you like to run or you have 10 hours you don't know what to do with, uh, you can hear the whole story and the backstory of, of how this, this, this came to be. Uh, so just Google that and you'll find it as a podcast. So now let me drill down a little bit more into science. Okay, so uh, SMA, is caused by a deletion or a mutation in the SM1 and SNM1 gene. So there's a gene called SMN1, and it makes an RNA like uh, genes do, and the RNA has introns in it that's not made contiguously. There's, there's these little pieces of RNA that, that don't belong in the mature message, and they get spliced out, and someone named Phil Sharp got the Nobel Prize somewhere like 30, 40 years ago for figuring that out. Then there's the mature RNA, and then it gets, that gets translated into the protein, 
and the protein goes about doing its business. When you have SMA, this gene is either deleted or badly broken in some way, and it just, it's not, it doesn't work. The rescue comes because there happens to be another gene in the human genome called SMN2. And <clears throat> this is a broken gene from the get-go. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't work. I mean, it, it's got a mutation in it that, that doesn't allow the splicing of this exon to go where it's supposed to go. And so you get a, a protein that's uh, an mRNA that encodes a truncated protein, which gets rapidly degraded. And so um, uh, the idea came uh, to Frank and his colleague Adrian that uh, if we dropped an oligonucleotide precisely in the area that it needs to drop, in order to enable this splicing to happen in the correct fashion, we can restore the ability to make this, this protein. And that's exactly what happens. That's why this works. So, you know, one oligonucleotide dropped in in exactly the right place has these miraculous effects on, on children's health. So a little bit more granularity. Um, uh, uh, this is the exon 7 and exon 8 and the piece of RNA in between that's supposed to be spliced out. And because of the mutation, these protein factors bind here, and they don't come off, and they, they, they block this thing called a U1 SNRNP, which is an RNA protein complex, from binding where it's supposed to bind and enabling the splicing to occur like normal. So if you drop in the oligonucleotide in the just the right spot, it displaces these negative splicing factors, enables this thing to bind where it's supposed to bind, enables the splicing to occur like it's supposed to occur, and then enables the protein uh, to be made. So this is kind of getting a little bit more granular, but you can see the concept of precision genetic medicine where you know exactly what the problem is, and, and you can come in with a therapy that works exactly in that spot and you have a biological mechanism to, to correct something. So um, uh, that's all I'll say about that. Um, this is a, a timeline for companies that uh, work on Watson-Crick interaction inside the cell to make a therapeutic of some sort. So we, we were the first in 1989. Um, a mechanism called siRNA came along about a decade later and a, a well-known company called l Nylon got started to make oligonucleotides that work by that mechanism that are double-stranded instead of single-stranded. And then there were a bunch of copycat companies that copied both of us, that uh, there's all these companies out there now that, you know, there's an Antisense Pharma and, you know, some of these over here. Um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of people making uh, therapies with Antisense oligonucleotides or double-stranded oligonucleotides, and that's a great thing. I mean, Lots of diseases are being addressed now uh, that couldn't be before. And then when the discovery of CRISPR came along within the last decade, a whole big bunch of companies got started to use that mechanism, you know, to actually go in and fix the DNA. You know, we, what we do is we address the root cause of the disease, but not in a permanent fashion. You need to have the oligonucleotide constantly present in order to, you know, it's kind of like HIV infections, you know, where you used to die and, and now you live a pretty normal life with medication, but you have to have medicine your whole life. These new kinds of therapies aspire to fix the foundational problem at the root cause. But at the end of the day, uh, there's, an, there's an RNA, uh, there's, a, uh, there's an interaction between RNA and DNA, a Watson-Crick base pairing inside the cell that leads the CRISPR to go where it needs to go and do what it needs to do. And so, you know, we're sitting here, I mean, I'm sitting here at Ionis at the moment, you know, 32 years later, and, you know, we've got a great technology, but, you know, we're always looking for, like, what's going to be the next big thing? What's going to come out here? And so I was actually away from the company for uh, uh, 10 years. I, I was here for the first 20, and then I was somewhere else, and then uh, I was recruited back. Uh, my, my original co-founder boss, who was the real genius behind all this, a guy named Stan Crook, whose, name's need, whose name needs to be mentioned in this conversation, uh, uh, he said, come back and help me figure out uh, how I can find the next antisense. What could be the next really big thing that comes out of nowhere that, that people don't think, you know, don't believe in and, 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 and we find a way? 
And so, you know, I, I said, okay, well, that sounds like a fun job. Um, I'll, I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll come back and I'll do that. And I, I thought about like, okay, in the mid eighties, what were we thinking? How, how did we come up with this? Right? So, um, uh, you know, it wasn't like, um, you know, we were sitting on a mountaintop and lightning struck and we said, oh, let's use it. I mean, there was, there was stuff in the literature. There was somebody named Paul Zamechnik from University of Massachusetts had published a couple papers in the late seventies that talked about the idea and, and there were some experiments there and the experiments were undoubtedly wrong, but, but the idea was there. And, and we said, you know, if we could figure out a way to make that a, a real therapeutic, and we thought about all the hurdles, it could be a huge breakthrough, you know, which it, which it was. And so in thinking about this, I said, well, I'm not going to sit here in my office and come up with this. I'm going to start reading and read literature with a mind, an open mind towards like, what can I stumble across that could be big, right? And I stumbled across this article in The Economist. It, it said, quantum technology is great for measuring. And it talked all about nitrogen vacancy stuff and NMR and MRIs. And, and it was fascinating. I said, wow, I mean, you know, if quantum mechanics is being used in diagnostics these days and it's making a revolution, may, maybe there's an opportunity in therapeutics. So I started reading about quantum biology and I read John Joe's books and I read, you know, a bunch of articles by, you know, a number of people listening to me at the moment. And then I stumbled across this article. Are we quantum computers or merely clever robots? And, 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 I, and I read about the sort of fascinating creation of a hypothesis that uh, frankly stands a low probability of being correct. Um, but if it does, uh, it's, it, it, it's a Nobel Prize of the order of magnitude of like Watson Crick or, or Einstein. Or I mean, it just, you know, the notion that, that there might be quantum processing in the brain smells to me like you know, something as crazy as antisense was when I started. So I'm already predisposed towards crazy, okay? And so let me construct a little bit of logic for crazy, okay? So, you know, um, understanding life's secrets leads to opportunities to correct life's mistakes, you know, diseases. So, you know, over 100 years ago, the germ theory of disease came along, and, you know, examples are sepsis and viral infections, and, and understanding the root cause of the disease allows for therapies at the root cause. So antibiotics and vaccines came along. And then in the 50s and 60s, enzymes and receptors were discovered. And then it was discovered that you could take small molecules and inhibit enzymes and receptors that are causing problems and bring about a therapeutic benefit for things like high blood pressure, heart disease, my guess is that half the people hearing me at the moment are on a medication for one of these or the other, you know, for beta blockers or statins to prevent heart disease. And it's a big uh, advance. You know, then the human genome sequence came along and that enabled under, uh, finding the underlying problem causing a variety of other diseases, including spinal muscular atrophy. And that enabled therapy at the root cause with antisense or siRNAs or gene therapy or gene editing. And so now we're in a new landscape. Then it was discovered that there's uh, another layer of biology on top of the genome. There's the epigenome. There's biochemical changes to the DNA that, that regulate the, uh, the way the letters are, are used. And then a, a, a few diseases have been identified that, that represent a flaw in something to do with managing the epi, epigenetics and then epigenome editing is, is coming about now. And so, you know, now I extrapolate, okay? So, you know, is there another layer of biology uh, that's happening that we don't know anything about yet, but if we can follow up on some interesting hypotheses, maybe we could find it. So is there quantum processing in the brain? And, and you know, maybe, you know, Alzheimer's disease or the forms of ALS that don't have a genetic cause are, are, are driven by some mismanagement of that quantum process. If anybody tells you we understand uh, the root cause of Alzheimer's disease or ALS, laugh, all right, because we don't, right? And so maybe, and my, my, my colleague Frank suggested this as a, 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 you know, a fun 
maybe we've solved the problem by editing defective midi chlorians, right? And so I, I didn't know what they were, but I Googled and I found that midi chlorians are intelligent life forms that originated at the foundation of life at the center of the galaxy. And they're in all living organisms. And if you have a lot of them, like this Luke, Luke Skywalker had, uh, uh, you, can, you can do a lot and you're smart and you, you can do stuff. So, you know, uh, but in all seriousness, we don't know the root cause of a lot of disease. If you look up ailments of unknown cause in Wikipedia, you'll find that there are 92 pages where each ailment of an unknown cause gets a page. You know, so, you know, while the human genome has unearthed the root cause problem of a lot of disease, there's a whole lot more that is not understood and my bet is that there's a layer of biology happening that, that we need to understand, and then we will understand more root causes. So um, uh, I don't have answers here. I, I'm sort of explaining the logic that led me to, to fund in this area. And so, you know, I've been going to these seminars, you know, Clarissa's at UCLA and, and this one and reading and reading books, and, and I'm trying to connect quantum biology to precision genetic medicine. And, and I don't have answers yet, but I want to poke you, you guys, to help here. So, um, you know, in the, in the discussion of Professor Fisher here, uh, uh, he basically introduced, and, and I know there was other stuff that other people talked about, the quantum brain, you know, um, Penrose and so forth, but, uh, you know, this really triggered uh, the concept of, okay, if there's quantum processing, where are the qubits, right? Posner molecules, maybe. Uh, Professor Simon has talked about maybe photons being the qubits. And I think this has triggered uh, a focusing of thought processes around like, okay, where are the qubits, right? I, I've heard about polarized electron transport and metabolism. And I, you know, I, I visited Clarice and, and uh, uh, read her really phenomenal paper uh, uh, from a month or so ago. And I don't know how to fit that in to, uh, you know, what's going on with metabolism or some layer of biology. I've heard a lot about magnetic fields and, and you know, there was a, a phenomenal seminar by someone named Wendy Bean who talked about take away the Earth's magnetic field by some sort of a Faraday cage type thing. And, and you know, cut open a worm and the worm doesn't heal like it's supposed to because it doesn't have a magnetic field. What's going on with that, right? There's a layer of biology happening here that that that, that observation says has to be there. And of course, radical pair mechanisms, you know, Margaret and others talk about, you know, um, uh, you know, things that ultimately come down to radical pairs. And of course, there's the discussions about anesthetics, right? So let me talk about three possible opportunities. I think about it in these three buckets. So opportunity number one is um, uh, what I've been, the case I've been making all along is that understanding fundamental biological processes where quantum effects takes place can lead to insights into disease that we don't know the cause. Once we understand the biological process, then we will find, I assure you, genetic causes that, that interact with that, that biological layer uh, and interfere with it, and that will enable opportunities for for uh, intervention. And so, I, I, I have very little doubt there's one or more Nobel prizes out there for discovering, you know, a quantum layer of of life, and I believe that it will help identify the root cause of diseases uh, without a known cause. Just just on a belief because of that that slide I showed you is like once we know about another layer, we learn about another disease, right? Opportunity number two, I think, comes in uh, using quantum processes as tools to intervene in diseases that are not necessarily driven by some quantum effect, right? And, and I'm fascinated by these lectures on pulse magnetic fields and light and sound. And, and, and these things seem to be unrelated to me because the kind of energy they are, the kinds of things they do uh, are all different. But, you know, is there something that connects those things? You know, is there something about life that likes to live on certain frequencies or channels? Uh, it's fascinating that therapeutic benefits all seem to be similar from these things. 
And of course, everybody can point to, you know, now we're perturbing reactive oxygen. Reactive oxygen leads to inflammation. Inflammation leads to, you know, all kinds of problems. And so, you know, maybe that's a common denominator. But I have a really hard time relating that to precision genetic medicine as I've explained it to you here. I, I can't connect the dots, right? Opportunity number three, and I think this is the most likely to be achievable in, 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 in real time, is if we can use quantum mechanics as a tool to make more precise genetic medicines, right? So, you know, it's not about another layer of biology where quantum effects are taking place, but, you know, uh, you know everybody probably has heard quite a bit about CRISPR, you know, a gene editing technology can go in and, and, and fix the DNA that's the root cause of a disease. The, the trouble with that is um, uh, you really want to use CRISPR to fix something in a specific organ and tissue and, and not anywhere else, right? You know, I mean, if, you, if you've got a disease of the liver, you want to fix the liver, you want to fix the brain, or you want to fix the pituitary or the muscle, right? And, and, and you really don't want to go in to other organs and tissues uh, and potentially have effects that are not intended and, and cause damage to the DNA. And so, uh, uh, you know, we, we here at Ionis are getting into um, uh, gene editing as a, as, as a next thing. But, uh, you know, if somebody could come up with a way to, uh, you know, use quantum mechanics and somehow to, to uh, you know, when you put a medicine into a person's body and it just distributes all throughout the body, come up with a way to trigger it to work uh, in a directed localized fashion, you know, maybe with some uh, magnetic field or some electromagnetic radiation, that would be something that I think would be a real breakthrough in, in the field, just using quantum stuff as a tool. So this is my last slide. And, you know, as I mentioned, I'm funding uh, six academic groups uh, in, in, in quantum biology. Uh, the, the projects, I think, would be hard to get funding by a traditional agency because the ideas don't have much proof or they're too crazy. And, and as you all know now, I'm, I'm preconditioned to be uh, acceptable. Uh, crazy is acceptable to me. It's desirable. So I started this program within the company uh, called Ion ARPA for sort of the contraction of uh, Ionis and DARPA. And I'm sure most of you know what, what, you know, what DARPA is. And it turns out that um, during my career, like over 23 years contiguously, I'd been funded um, by DARPA for a whole variety of projects over the decades. And um, uh, uh, I was always, you know, okay at coming up with some new ideas that, that a program manager would, would like. And I liked the methodology because I liked what it has accomplished. I mean, it, it, it rewards crazy. Uh, uh, you know, it, it funds uh, ideas that are um, so out there that they wouldn't be funded by traditional mechanisms. And they're, they're high payoff opportunities, right? And so, you know, I, I, I put out a, um, a request for proposals in quantum biology, and I'm not doing that anymore because I'm funding um, uh, uh, six labs. And I want to see what insights come from that. However, um, uh, uh, seedling funding, you know, enough money to fund a postdoc. I mean, if anybody is inspired by anything I've said and has any ideas uh, that, 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 that could connect the quantum world to a therapeutic, to a layer of biology or to a way to get at therapeutics, you know, send me a five-page white paper on the idea, and I'll, I'll consider you know funding. I'll fund these things on a on kind of a rolling basis. You know, we've moved on from quantum biology, and I'm now funding about seven groups who have come up with new strategies to deliver macromolecular complexes to specific cells and tissues, and then another project uh, uh, to come up with new ways to edit the genome uh, that are not based upon CRISPR. And so. What I do in this initiative, and you know, I'm able to do this because we have the money from Spinraza. Uh, our CEO, uh, both the one Stanley Crook who retired recently, and our new one, uh, uh, said, we're, you know, we're going to plow a lot of this money back into new crazy ideas uh, to try to come up with the next really, really, really big thing. And so, um, uh, if you Google Ion ARPA or you go to um, uh, uh, our web page, you, you could find, there's a little video of me explaining the program and explaining how it works. 
and uh, the process for submitting proposals. And I, and I hope I've inspired somebody listening uh, who can kind of connect the dots between what they're doing in the quantum world and uh, precision genetic medicines. And um, uh, uh, I'd be happy to, 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 to see what people's ideas are. And that's, um, that's it. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you very much indeed.